South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has delayed his appearance in Parliament that was expected to hold today in order to answer lawmakers' questions, requesting time to consider a panel report that found preliminary evidence that he had violated his oath of office. The independent panel was appointed by the Speaker of Parliament to look into whether President Ramaphosa should face an, impeach an impeachment process over the scandal that involved the alleged theft of millions of dollars in cash from his private farm in Falafala. Now, Ramaphosa has denied any wrongdoing and is yet to be charged with any crime. The panel's recommendations come less than a month before an elective conference that will decide if the president gets a run for a second term on the governing African National Congress's ticket for the 2024 polls. Joining me now from Cape Town is political analyst Sanusha Naido. Sanusha, it's good to have you again. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, good afternoon, and uh, it's lovely to be on the show again. And, Unfortunately, and not for the reason we would expect, but it is a conversation we must have. Uh, so let's start with a bit of background, because uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa was also vice president at one point in time uh, to former President Jacob Zuma. And when he took office in 2018, he vowed to root out corruption in state institutions. But we've seen that throughout his tenure, his own uh, tenure has had some controversies and administrative issues around corruption as it stands. So let's start from that. This is not the only corruption scandal the president has found himself mired in. Why does this one seem so important? Why does this one uh, probably come to the top of the list, unfortunately? Yeah, I mean, I think this one actually touches to the very heart of some of the issues that the president had brought to the uh, internal executive meetings of the ANC, the African National Congress, particularly around how you need to deal with any kind of cloud hanging over your head when it comes to issues of criminal allegations and so forth. And we know that the former Secretary General of the party, who also is in being in, being charged with an asbestos fraud contract, has been, uh, had been compelled to step aside, and there was the tension around that as well. So I think this time around, it, it, it filters in from the fact that there's there were internal dynamics that under under President Ramaphosa's watch as 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 head of the party as well um, that he brought in in terms of what he thought were key issues that to deal with a much more transparent accountable set of uh, of, of of colleagues and cadres in the party members that needed to to operate on a clean ticket mm -hmm. now what happened with this whole controversy around and uh, the scandal that broke around the pala pala is the question of money that was on the farm in foreign currency that was not necessarily according to the report registered properly according to our financial regulation authority acts and so forth not disclosed and of course you know it's a lot sum of money that was kept in the farm for that for that period of time linked to that is the fact that the money got oh i don't know how much of it but money got stolen from that uh, amount and then they basically the people who allegedly stole the money were then tracked to namibia they were no namibian nationals is, is 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 what we were told and they were then tracked to Namibia, there was a, co a conversation between the president of South Africa and the Namibian president, and these people were then found. So it's, it's, it's not just about the fact that it, it has to do with criminal allegations. The fact that there are serious uh, allegations, when you read the report, around the, criminal, the, the, the question of whether this money was disclosed according to our financial regulatory uh, uh, frameworks, and also the challenge around uh, whether it constituted money laundering under the Prevention and Combating of Money Money Laundering Act. And, and so you're getting us deeper into that, so I want us to expand on this. So this report came out yesterday, and all of this is coming from a complaint filed by Arthur Fraser, who's a former head of the South African State Security Agency, who also provided CCTV. Uh, so there's still some questions as to how he even got to know, but he has been the one who has blown this whole thing uh, apart yeah. recently. And it raised questions about how the president acquired the money and whether he declared it. So for many of us, unfortunately, as Africans, we're not unused to hearing 
political leaders having such large amounts of money in their homes, not declaring or, or sort of finding ways around financial regulation. So particularly for South Africa, let's look at what the financial issues or the financial declaration uh, part of this conversation is. Why is it an issue for the president, who was also a, a businessman before becoming uh, president, who's been regarded as a billionaire businessman, to have such large amounts of money in his house and, it, and cash in his possession and possibly not declared? What does the law say about that for someone like the president? Okay, so basically in terms of the constitution, you are not supposed to actually get paid revenue if you are an official or a cabinet member uh, in public service, especially at the level at which the president occupies the post of president of the republic. Mm -hmm. Now, according to what the president had basically provided, uh, provided as answers to the questions that the panel had uh, asked him to respond to, he said he never got paid revenue from that. But this then is where the gray area tends to kick in, because that then means that you have to basically declare all of your assets. Now, there is a, there is a sense of whether declaring the assets that he had in terms of the farm and what the game, what the game farm was about, because auctions would happen in terms of wildlife. And, and, and of course, he said in one of his questions as a response, he's a farmer, he deal, he breeds these very expensive uh, 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 buffalo, and uh, he uses that as, as part of his, 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 um, his, his game farm, which then these auctions take place and people come and buy. But the challenge here is whether or not he sufficiently and would beyond a reasonable doubt had addressed the question of paid revenue. Now, if he had got any kind of, of funds from there, and it's actually over and above in terms of what the Constitution says that he, as the President of the Republic, cannot have, then it actually then raises questions about the, the, the relevant sections in the Constitution that he may have violated. That's the first. The second is that the money that is supposedly that was that, 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 that got stolen um, is very large currency. Now, you rightly mm -hmm. point out that in Africa, this seems to be a common occurrence by, politic, by leaders to have this kind of cash that's uh, within their household or stacked in their household. But the problem here is that we have rules. So every time that either myself or anybody gets a foreign transaction coming through the bank or coming through in any way or form, we've got to register it with the South African Reserve Bank. It's got to be notified to the South African uh, Revenue Service and it has also has to be notified to the Financial Intelligence Center. Now, these are key authorities that, that, that monitor the amount of foreign currency coming and going from the country, how much is coming in, how much is leaving. And we know that in the, in, in, in the last couple of years, this question of having uh, financial regulatory uh, frameworks in place, dealing with your financial asset task teams in terms of fraud, money mm. laundering, etc. in terms of the global, um, is linked to how it may be, uh, money may be, be, be being used for purposes beyond what we say it is. And I think that's where the challenge lies as well, is that these are key institutions and agencies that need to be abided by in terms of law, and this doesn't seem to happen. And so as the president of the country, you've got to basically also say that, you know, I talk transparency, I talk accountability, but then, of course, you can't keep deferring it to say, well, it was the, the protection services that didn't do what they're supposed to do. I thought they did what they're supposed to do. And it's just kind of got caught up in that kind of vagueness of the, of the answers that he had responded to in the questions that he was asked. Okay, so just to run through it for those who don't know, the allegations made against uh, South Africa's President Cyril Ramphosa include kidnapping, bribery, money laundering, as well as concealing a crime. So we have this independent panel now that has been set up and has found some preliminary evidence, prima facie evidence, uh, that the president did actually violate his oath of office. When we're looking at this, are we... From what you are hearing right now, rather, let me ask you that. Um, this evidence, or rather the conclusion that the panel has reached is coming primarily from the evidence that Arthur Frazier has provided, or is there an expansion of it? What was the remit of the independent panel in terms of looking into these allegations against the president? So if you read the report, it gives you a sense of what the terms of reference and the mandate it was, it was supposed to do. And the, 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 the terms of reference and its remit was basically to look at all the information that was there that was provided. So it's not just the Arthur Fraser affidavits and, 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 and the case that he had lodged with the, with, with the police, but it was also the representation from the party that initiated this, which was the African Transformation Movement. It was opposition parties. It was uh, uh, submissions from 
of the public as well as the information that President Ramaphosa had to furnish to the panel. And if you go and you read and you see what the uh, head of the panel, uh, Justice Nkobo, had said about how the information that they had to do their research uh, as well in terms of trying to find what was the uh, what was the information below the information and that also is where i think part of their recommendations are extrapolated from because they are arguing that there's that there's a lot of stuff that needs to be answered for that they could not necessarily ventilate sufficiently substantively in the time frame that they had hence they also asked for the extension which is why this report was supposed to have been delivered on the um, i think it was uh, 10 days ago mm. and of course it was delivered yesterday now the challenge here is for the parliament to decide on the 6th of december whether or not they're going to accept the recommendation of the panel bearing in mind that the panel's recommendation is not a binding recommendation for yes. parliament so the national assembly will have to decide that in terms of how they go forward and that's the debate on the 6th of december that's going to happen so what exactly has the panel now recommended it has recommended that the, that there is a case for the president to answer for in respect of the uh, pala pala issue and in respect of the issues that they've, they, 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 there's, there's, there's seven recommendations that they make at the end of the report which includes the ones that you put up on your screen but in terms of the fact that the, he's, there's a serious need for him to answer for in terms of the money, how it got there, what happened to it, uh, where did it come from, was it registered according to the laws of the financial laws of the country, did it actually, did the, the you know, when it was stolen, what was what, what was the relationship with that phone call with the president of Namibia? So there's about seven recommendations that they are making, but overall, the overall recommendation is that the president has to now. Answer. He has a case. There's a case for him to answer that there is something much more than what they could gather from that one month deliberation. Okay. So one of the things you pointed out was this was also sort of pushed forward by opposition parties, and we know that uh, parties like the African Transformation Movement, as well as the United Democratic Movement, have now written to Parliament, and they're asking for an inquiry into the allegations and demanding that the president take a sabbatical leave until law enforcement concludes its investigation. Before we get to the potential of impeachment and what could happen next week, what do you think about this? This has also come up with the ANC in recent times uh, when some other corruption issues came up involving some former uh, high-ranking officials of the party about stepping aside while investigations, internal party investigations, and some of them uh, official investigations are carried out. What do you really think should happen at this point? This is the president of the country who has run an anti-corruption campaign with a party that continues to be unfortunately marred in corruption scandals now being the one at the center of it all. Is this a situation where President Cyril Mafosa should be taking a sabbatical leave? Well, it's a very tenuous situation right now because the two parties that are requesting Parliament to make that, uh, to pursue that kind of, uh, to, uh, of action, it's very difficult to do because Parliament is a very procedural institution. Mm -hmm. You must remember that it has to follow the process. So the process right now going forward from a parliamentary position. I'm not talking the party, I'm not talking about what's going on in the party, we'll come to that in a little while. What's going on right now is that on the 6th of December, there's going to be a debate. A debate on the, on, on the report and to decide whether the report and the recommendation that has been made by the panel that gets adopted. Now, this has very important implications for whether or not that if they if they do adopt the, 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 the report and the recommendations, then, of course, the, the issue would be, does the president take a sabbatical? But before we get to the sabbatical or what happens uh, after the 6th of December, because remember, voting as well is, is going to be a quite a quite a critical issue. Do, mm. they, do you have a secret ballot or do you have an open, open ballot? ballot? Now, a secret ballot may uh, even open up the space for people within the ANC caucus in parliament to vote for the for, for, uh, in favor of the recommendation. But all of this hinges on what happens now in the ANC, because right now and later on today, the National Executive Committee is meeting to discuss the very same issues that you're raising. Mm. Does the president take a step? Does he step aside now or does he resign? And if he does, what, where do we go? There's two things that could happen here. 
One is that he could say he wants to resign. And, the, uh, and, and of course, the NEC could then say, no, 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 we don't want you to resign, and then go to parliament and kind of caucus and then just close ranks and make sure that that, that report doesn't get adopted with the recommendation because they need, it to, you know, they need the majority to do so. And that hinges on the fact of whether it's an open ballot or a secret ballot. Mm -hmm. Or it could be that they ask him to step aside now, which then means that he will have to abide by that if it's a consensus and a, and, 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 and a, and a, a consensus and a unanimous decision in the NEC. But that even too is quite difficult to predict because the, 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 the feeling or the sense that one gets from what's happening within the internal dynamics of the party is that it's so unpredictable. Mm. It's so obtuse and it's untenable. Nobody knows which way it's going to fall, which way they're going to decide and how the discussions are going to happen because they, everybody is in a acrimonious position right now. Now, the opponents are after him. He's come up with the step aside rule. He needs to abide by it. His presidency was the anti corruption campaign. He went after people in the party. So it's really, really tenuous. And then finally, I think we have to also bear in mind is that in our constitution, I don't think we have the idea, uh, we don't have the, 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 the the, the, the ambit to say we can call early elections, national elections. But right now, the official opposition party is making that proposal to parliament to table a, propos a proposal to say, let's have early elections. Because if we have early elections, I think we'll also have to deal with the fact that who comes to uh, take on the position and who serves as the next president? Obviously, it will be the deputy president of the, of the republic. But then, of course, there's a sense that there's a feeling of also, people, uh, opposition parties, particularly the, uh, the the official opposition party, probably feeling a bit nervous as well in terms of what happens to the ANC because how yes. that will actually impact on the entire body politic of the state. And ordinary South Africans are caught in a very, you know, uh, an unfettered position right now. They they also are not uncertain about where this is going. Should we should Ramaphosa stay? It's easier for him to be there. We know he keeps it. Even if it's he, he's done this, it, you know, we don't know what's going to come down the line if he is, is forced to resign or forced to step aside. It's all very uncertain. And I was going to ask you to look into a crystal ball and give me an idea of what you think will happen in Parliament on December the 6th, but that doesn't look like it's going to be possible. But just to, again, let the audience know, uh, South African legislators are expected to examine the findings of the panel in a one-day city on December the 6th, where parliaments will adopt a resolution through a simple majority vote, whether further action by the House is necessary or not. And that's what we're looking at that could possibly lead to uh, potential impeachment proceedings against uh, President than Cyril Ramaphosa. So there are three dates or three happenings right now along the timeline we're keeping uh, watch of. That, of course, is, of course, the uh, Executive Council meeting of the African National Congress today, which could also have ramifications for the December 6th uh, sitting as well, which could then also have ramifications for the elective uh, Congress elective meeting that's scheduled, I believe, to be about two uh, weeks. You wanted to say something, Sanusha? Yeah. In fact, I wanted to just pick up on the elective conference. Uh, which is going to happen on December 16th mm. in less than two weeks' time, and that's going to be critical. So I think also what we're going to be what we're going to be mindful of is the fact that, however this plays out in terms of whether the president is asked to to step aside both in the party and then of course step uh, take a sabbatical at, uh, or resign or whatever we want to call it in this, as president of the republic, it's going to impact that elective conference. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think what's also important to bear in mind is that even if he doesn't well, step aside, or he's not, or, or, or the party closes ranks in in parliament on this. It's still going to have a negative impact on him at the elective conference because even though he may enjoy the largest number of nominations, this now has really put a a, a serious dilemma, a serious damper on his credibility, his uh, optics, his branding, his image. Going into an elective conference, he's going in really, really Damn in it. a very, very difficult position. Yes, some have said that this has actually wounded him going into that Congress. So as you talk about his president, uh, his personal branding and standing, I now my final question has to expand it beyond uh, President Ramaphosa to the African National Congress as it stands. This would be the second president uh, under who is a representative of the party that has found themselves mired in a personal corruption scandal. Former President Jacob Zuma, we know, of course, of the panel reports that have come out from that uh, being handed over to this president. But now Ramaphosa himself is also there. What do we say about this in terms of the legitimacy of the ANC, particularly with South Africa's present position? High unemployment, struggling continuously with um, 
with ESCOM's electricity load shedding that is now costing the economy as well. Having so many situations around that high cost of living, we've seen the, uh, the strikes that have happened. It's been strike season for South Africa for the past three or four months as it is. So this also brings into question the legitimacy of ANC's leading of the country, particularly in the economic uh, point of view. What do you think about that? It's dire times. I mean, if you look at the economy, even though the, the, uh, the, the economic data, I mean, the employment data came out yesterday to show that uh, employment dropped by one percent, uh, unemployment dropped by one percent. It's yes. not, we're not creating jobs. Uh, inflation has just been really high. Interest rates have been hiked for a consecutive uh, time in terms of a high uh, 75 basis points. It, People are just finding it difficult to, to, to survive. And of course, the challenge that the, that the ANC finds itself in is that it's, this internal dynamics have just overwhelmed it. So I think the question about whether its, it's credibility, its legitimacy is something that's under the spotlight, I think it's just gone over the tipping point. I think people are becoming frustrated. And that's the point I was making earlier about, you know, Ramaphosa, as much as um, there's a sense of, you know, what, how did how did it how did it become how did it come to this situation with regard to this whole pala pala issue? There is a sense also by one or two people that have been phoning into radio stations to suggest that you know he, irrespective, let him stay on because this is somebody we know. We just mm. don't know what's going to come out of the ANC. So that uncertainty of the ANC, coupled by the question of legitimacy and the credibility crisis and the fact that there's almost a future futureless kind of, of, of impression and feeling of, of dread and despair in the country um, is also part of the fact of where is this going in terms of who takes on the mantle from Ramaphosa and there's just not that confidence anymore. All right, so we have to leave the conversation here, but we'll be following very closely throughout the day and into the coming weeks as well. So I do know that, uh, Sanusha, we'll be talking to you again. Uh, an outstanding case that many across the continent are keeping their eyes on. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, and have a great day. All right, you too. So an independent panel that was set up by the Speaker of the South African Parliament has found that President Cyril Ramaphosa does have a case to answer about money that was found at his Palapala farm and the attendant uh, sort of actions and decisions that were taken after that. Now, all of this started when Arthur Fraser, the former head of South Africa's uh, spy agency, walked into a police station and laid a multi-page complaint against the, pers uh, the president with CCTV footage to back up his claims. It's been several months now since then, but it's still a few more weeks to find out what will happen. Can President Cyril Ramaphosa possibly survive? And could he make it from surviving an impeachment in the parliament to surviving the elective Congress coming up for the ANC? We'll be following very closely right here on News Central because we put African stories and African news front and center. Up next, we get into international business. And when we're done with that, we're in Mozambique, where the biggest corruption scandal may take five days to find out what happens to the 19 defendants. Stick around.